Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Rabbi Matziah Daf Samach Bet. Today's stuff is sponsored by Yechiel Berkowitz. In loving memory of his mother, Sarah F. Berkowitz, she was a Holocaust survivor and strong supporter of Jewish education. Okay, we're going to get started. Um, okay, as you have seen, this is not the easiest chapter. It's actually one of the most challenging chapters of Shas. Um, I will warn you. We're going to have, it's also, as we learn, we're going to unfold all sorts of things. So you don't know everything at the beginning. Hopefully by the end, things will become more clear. You'll get a handle on the basics of the differentiations we're going to make. Um, again, we started with this difference between Ribita Oraita, Ribita Rabbanan. I'll just give like a very broad definition, which is what we're in the middle of a machlok at about right now. How we treat, why, what's the difference if it's Ribita Oraita, Ribita Rabbanan, or potentially why there's a difference. On one side of the machlok, there's a difference. Um, where Ribit Ketsutza is what we have from the beginning, I loan you money, and I basically say I'm going to take interest on it. That is rebeat by Torah law. But if we didn't agree on rebeat in the beginning, but perhaps there's a way that there might be rebeat here, or there is interest here, then we're going to have rebeat to Rabbanan, and we call that avak rebeat. It's like dust of rebeat, because it's, right, dust is like, it has some particles of rebeat. comes from rebeat, but it's not exactly interest. So we have a machloket right now between Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Elchanan, about this distinction, do right de Rabbanan, rabbinic or Torah law, rebeat. Is the Torah law rebeat, does it mean that if I collected interest, the court can force me to return it to you? According to Rabbi Yochanan, no, it doesn't matter if it's rabbinic or Torah law. I'm never forced to return the rebeat. According to Rabbi Elazar, I am forced. So now we're up to, we saw the reason for Rabbi Yochanan, who says you're not forced to return interest. Now we're going to see the reason for Rabbi Elazar. We're starting from the bottom of Samachal from the Bet. Amar Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak, my time at the Rabbi Elazar. Tamar Kra v'chei achichei mach. Now this isn't just a random pasuk. This is the pasuk that had to do with interest, and it says, "Al tikach mito neshach v'tarbi." Don't take interest from someone you loan money to. V'yorei tamei alohecha, you should fear God. V'chei achichei mach, and your brother should dwell among you or should live with you. So what does it mean your brother should live with you? Comes Rabbi Elazar and explains, or the Gemara explains according to him. Okay, and Raj, um, the Bach, the, the ed notes of the Bach on the text of the Gemara, he often adds a word or takes out a word. He says there's a word missing here. It should say, So that it will be good to him with, to live with you. Why does it say your brother shall live with you? In order to say, return that money so that you can live together harmoni- harmoniously and not end up in this big fight because you took interest and you never gave it back. So therefore, you're required to return the interest. So that's how he understands that pasuk, to which they're now going to have the ping pong and say, Rabbi Yochanan, what does Rabbi Yochanan do with this? Now we get off on a total tangent. Okay, if, if you, you know, we already got into the Tandurosh Lachnai story here. We're going to get into another very famous suga. And just a few days ago, we had Tandurosh Lachnai. Um, I think it didn't go up yet, but there's going to be a gefet on Tanarosh Lachnai. Um, hopefully it will go up today if it hasn't gone up yet. Um, so about like more in detail, if you learn Tanarosh Lachnai, um, you want to learn more. It's a very famous story. There's a lot to it. So here we're also going to get to a very famous story. It's needed, and by the way, there was also, I just, I recorded everything before, so I didn't mention it on the, on the, on the shear, but also about Ona'a, um, the whole topic of Ona'a, Lana Stein Hain's shear also went up last week about that. I think that neither of them, because it was the Chag, I think neither of them ended up on the, on the podcast, it'll go up today. Um, okay, so now we get to a very famous, Rabbi Yochanan takes this Pasuk, or at least what they're suggesting, what does Rabbi Yochanan do with this? We're going to quote now Rabbi Akiva and a machloka between him and Ben Petora, but a very big moral dilemma, which you've probably heard of. So what does he use this pasuk for? Oh, he uses it for what Rabbi Akiva used it for. And therefore, don't question him and say, means you have to return the money. So he uses this for something totally different. Two people are on a road. Okay, there's nothing around. One has a canteen of water. Only one of them. The other one has no water. In Shotim Shnehem, the facts on the ground are, if both of them drink from this canteen and they share it, Metim, they will both die. It's not enough water for either of them to survive. Ve'im Shoteh but if one of them drinks the entire canteen, Magyali Yishuv, that person will survive. So what do you do? Do you have to share the canteen? Do you drink it all yourself and watch your friend die? 
Darash ben Petora. Ben Petora says, Mutav sheishu shnehem v'yamutu v'al yerecha mehem b'mitzato shel chavero. You should share this and don't watch your friend die while you drink the canteen of water. That seems morally incorrect. Better you should both die and not have one cause the death of the other. Ad Shabara Akiva, this very strange language. Ad Shabara Akiva usually means, we actually had it in the Haggadah, Ad Shabara Ben Zoma Vidarash, right? They understood something one way until this person came. So it usually means that the other person in the end changed their mind. But that's not really what seems to be here. And in fact, some people have the version Amarlo Rabbi Akiva. It's a different version that appears here, which is just Rabbi Akiva retorted. In other words, we have a debate between them. Ben Petora thinks, no, you can't, you right? You have to share it. You can't drink it yourself. What does that mean? Your brother should dwell with, should live, right? Not dwell, live with you. Okay, we kind of understood it as your brother should live with you, like dwell among you and you should have peace between you. And that's why you should return the money that you took that wasn't fair that you took it. But this is something totally different. Your brother should survive with you, meaning, you're only required to help your brother live if you yourself are going to live. If it's going to cause your own death, you're actually not required. And therefore, keep yourself alive and not your brother. Now, this is an interesting, there's, there's a way to look at this, which is, um, I think, I don't remember who says this, but the way to, that there's a way to look at this is not that you're causing the death of the other person, but you're actually required to save your own life. Because you're required to save your own life, we focus on what you're doing, which is you're saving your own life and not on what the effects of that are on somebody else. Because you're kind of maintaining status quo. This is your canteen. You're allowed to save your life. And if it's indirectly causing the death of somebody else, that's not your responsibility. So it's a fascinating question. Um, obviously, you have to come up with, you know, what if, you know, you could come up with a million permutations. What if, you know, it's not clear if you're both going to die if you share it? And what if, you know, you might get to somewhere where there is water and all sorts of questions that come up. Anyway, we're going to put this aside because it's not our main topic and we have quite a complicated stuff coming up. So, um, but here comes, it's so, so is fun when these very famous sugyo come up and we see them in sound. Metive. And what's interesting about it is it comes up totally not in the context of anything. This is really just because we talked about that pasuk. And, and the other question, by the way, that begs the question is, According to Rabbi Kiva's explanation, why is this in a pasuk that has to do with taking money from taking interest, right? It has absolutely nothing to do with the topic of two people surviving in a desert or wherever it is without water. So anyway, it's a good question. Metive. Now we're going to bring two difficulties with Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan had said that even ribik tzutza, you do not force the other person to repay. So we're going to have two Tanitic sources that seem to contradict. One of them we learned already in Baba Kama. If your father left, to, a father left to orphans, an obligation meaning he left them, rebeat that he had collected from somebody else, collected interest. And then he died. So the father collected money on interest. The children knew that it was money collected on interest. They don't have to return that money. Now, what does that sound like? If a person collected money on interest and didn't return it, the children don't have to return it. But it sounds like if the person himself was alive, they would be. And the only point it's telling you is just orphans don't need to return that type of obligation of a father. But the father himself for sure should have to. So they say, no, not true. You don't have to infer that from here. Definitely possible, you could say, the father also doesn't have to return. But I did to buy the money, they say, for now, why did it say then? It was, why was it focusing on the orphans? In other words, the father doesn't need to return the interest, like Rabbi Yachanan said, and also the children don't need to. So why did it bring up a case of children? Because it wanted to, con to contrast it, foil it with the next case. In the end of that source, it says, If the father stole a cow or a, or a cloak, or anything that was noticeable and clear that it was the father's, that people would come and say, oh, look, there's that stolen cloak that so-and-so stole. The children need to return it out of respect for their father. So that's why, 
That's why the Reisha was also talking about the children. It was trying to say, if it's just interest, even the father didn't have to return it, and for sure the children don't need to return it. But if it's something noticeable that people will talk about and say, oh, look, there's the thing that so-and-so stole, that's not respectful for the father. Even once they're dead, out of respect for the father, the children should have to return it. So now the Gemara says, wait a minute. Okay, so that's the answer to Rabbi Yochanan. You could still say that the father himself doesn't need to return it. You can't, you don't, can't necessarily infer from the source that the father does need to return it. Okay, then we resolve that. But this is as an aside point. The Gemara asks, why are they responsible from Kvod Avihem to return the item? It says that you can't curse a prince from your nation. Now, why does it say from your nation? Shouldn't be, right? It could be any, right? It could be a prince even not in your nation. So what does this word Ba'amcha add? First of all, this is understood. Not only can you not curse a prince, you can't curse anybody. And... They say, but well, what's ba'amcha? Only if they're osema samcha. Only if they keep to the to the tenets of your beliefs and they 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 live a good, you know, proper Jewish life. Not, let's say, a thief. So now you have to make a few jumps. This is about cursing a nasi, a prince, which then is understood to be cursing people in general. And from here they learn to cursing parents and respect for parents that all the laws of respect for parents are not in effect. It's fascinating. So we're going to get to it more in Sanhedrin. Are you obligated to respect your parents if they don't keep the mitzvah? Okay. According to this, you're not obligated to respect your parents if they're not doing ma'ase amcha. Okay. And it's taken from kind of out of context about this nasiba amcha. So basically what they're going to say is, I don't understand. The father stole a para, let's say a cow. Now the father died. The para is still in the, in the estate. So the children inherit the para. The children have to return that para out of respect for the father so that people don't keep saying, oh, look, that's the para that so-and-so stole, and, you know, they'll make a bad name for the father. But why would the children be obligated in respect for the father if the father is not, it, it was a thief? So they answer, Kedama Rabbi Pinchas, so Rabbi Pinchas said this actually comes from a different context, of Sugi and Chagiga. Rabbi Pinchas says, Mishmei de Rava, B'Sha'asa Tshuva. It's talking about a case where the father repented. So now the Gemara says, okay, wait. The father repented. What do you do when you repent, when you steal something? You return it. So they ask, right? So first of all, they say, just like Rabbi Pinchas answered, we had a question in some other case. We'll say the same thing here. To which the Gemara says, If the father did tshuva and that's the case, then what's the para doing there? The father obviously must have returned the para if he did tshuva. So how can you possibly explain that this is all when the father did tshuva? Which takes us back to our question. What happened was the father did tshuva on his deathbed and he didn't have enough time or wherewithal at that point to return the para. That's when the children are obligated. So the children are only obligated to return the para in the case where the father did tshuva. Okay, but that was an aside. The whole reason we brought this was because of the inference from the first case, which was if the father left Ma'od of Rebit, the children don't have to return it, which made it sound like the father does have to return it, to which we said, no, no, no. It was really only brought, that case of the orphans, to foil it with the second case, with the para, and therefore, it's not a problem with Rabbi Yochanan. Second difficulty against Rabbi Yochanan, Metive. Hagazlanim, thieves, or Melabe Rebit, or ones who take money on interest, usurers, even if they already collected okay, this sounds very clear if you collect the money on interest you have to return but before we get to dealing with the difficulty they say something doesn't make sense in this at all because the words here say even though they collected they have to return now collected is used this word gavu is a word that it doesn't translate into english as well because collected could be any kind of collecting but it means collected like you were owed money and you took, you collected the money, which works perfectly for Milavebri beat. That's what you did. You collected the money you were owed from the, the loan. But thieves, what, what, thieves don't collect, thieves steal, right? There's no collection that the thief is supposed to collect something they're owed. Definitely not. So gazlanim, my afopisha gavuika, what kind of gvia is there? Collecting of a loan. E gazul, the zul. If they stole, then it's stolen. It's not collected. E gazul, if they didn't steal it, well then, then they wouldn't be called a thief. In other words, if you're calling them a thief, it means they stole. And it doesn't mean they collected. So something doesn't make sense here. 
אלא אם הגזלנים, it should read like this, ומי ניהו? מלווה בריבית. מלווה בריבית. They're saying, the word גזלנים here is not used as a thief. It's used to explain this type of thief, which is someone who takes money they're not supposed to take, which is someone who collects money on interest. And then there's not two different cases here. There's only one case. It's all about a מלווה בריבית, someone who loans money on interest, who we're calling a thief. Okay, that's all. Okay, so we dealt with that. Right, and that's Afa Pisha Kavu Now we get back to what it says, which is if you collected money on interest, and we're calling you a thief because you took money you're not supposed to take, which is money on interest, with interest, if you collected it, you have to return it. This seems clearly against Rabbi Yochanan. So the Gemara is going to give an answer, but then say it's not so clear this is a good answer. So we're going to be left with maybe there's an answer, but it's not a clear cut answer. So the answer they give is Tanaihi. Okay, well, don't question Rabbi Yochanan from this Tanaitic source, because this Tanaitic source, there's a debate about it. So we could just say this Tanaitic source holds against Rabbi Yochanan, but Rabbi Yochanan will hold by a different, different Tanaim. So let's see the Machloka Tanaim. How do we know, and this is going to be what's not so clear, how do we know what we basically are saying is that Machloka between Rabbi Lazar and Rabbi Yochanan is a Tanaitic debate. So when you throw a source and say, oh, this contradicts Rabbi Yochanan, which is a Tanaic source, you could just simply say, that holds by the opinion that Rabbi Yochanan doesn't subscribe to. And he holds by different Tanaim. And then you're okay. But the problem is, it's not going to be 100% clear that this is exactly a Machloka Tanaim. So if you're going to accept reading number one, that it's a Machloka Tanaim, then you're okay. If you don't accept it, which is going to be reading number two, then you're left with the difficulty with Rabbi Yochanan. So here's the debate. Did Tanaim. We're only actually going to hear one side of the debate. We're going to hear two Tanaim that say this. The assumption is that these two Tanaim say this. It must be the rabbis, the, the general opinion, disagrees with them. Rabbi Nechemia and Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov putrim et ha-malve ve-et ha-arev mipnei sheyesh bahem kum ase. The rabbis think, and we talked about this in the beginning, you get lashes if you, if you take money on interest, and not only if you loan money on interest, if you are the love who gives money on interest. You could also be an Arev, a guarantor for a loan. You're going to get lashes, okay? Anyone who's involved with a loan that has interest is going to have a problem. But these two rabbis say, you don't get lashes. Why not? Because there's certain types of things that you don't get lashes for. One of them is called a lav hanitak lase. It's a lotase that has a mitzvah ase, it's a negative commandment, that has a positive commandment that fixes it, that basically can rectify the situation. Like stealing, you return the item. Okay, so let's see. Potrim et ha-malve v'tarv mepnei she'esh pa kum ase. So the malve, the, loan, the one who loans on interest, and the guarantor to a loan, basically, and presumably also the lova, I don't know why it's not mentioned here, but have a way to fix it. What's the way to fix it? My kum ase. Lav mishum da'amrinan lehu kumu ahaduru. Is it not because we can say to them, go return it? So the malve doesn't get lashed. I guess that's why it's the malve, although you have to think about why the guarantor. But the malve basically can take interest, right? So they're not, they can't take interest. But if they did, it can be fixed by returning it, just like you steal something, you return it. So you're not going to get lashes for this sin because you can fix it. And the assumption is, how do you fix it? What's the positive commandment? And this is where there's going to be a debate. We assume the positive commandment is kumu haduru, go return it. So since you can return it, you don't get lashes for it. Michla, that, that's just a principle that if there's a mitzvah and say that fixes it, there's no lashes on the low test, even if you didn't fix it. But you just just not something that you get lashes for. We'll talk about this more in Mako when we get to like all the laws of lashes. So now they say, Michla, from here, what can you infer? The fact that these two rabbis said it has a kum ase and you don't get lashes for it, it must be the rabbis disagree and say, no, you do get lashes because there is no mitzvah ase to return it. And there you have it. That is Rabbi Yochanan's opinion, like the rabbis, and Rabbi Elazar holds by these two Tanaim, right? So now they say, it must be that the rabbis disagree, or the Tanakam, who's not mentioned here, the first Tana, will say, no, you don't have to return it, and that must fit with Rabbi Yochanan. To which the Gemara says, it's not clear that that's the Ase, the positive commandment here. My Kumase, maybe Kumase is Likla Shtara, to rip the Shtar. If I took money on, if I loaned to you money on interest, now, I didn't yet collect the money. And as we were assuming, I collected the money. I'm not going to get lashes because I can return it. Now we're going to say, oh no, I loaned you money on interest. I can just rip up the star and just never collect it. So 
right? I loaned you money, but I ripped the star, so I'm not going to get lashes for it. So now the question is, and this is a good question, when am I, when do I, when do I uh, transgress the negative commandment, don't lend money on interest? When I loan the money or when I collected the money? Because this makes it sound like when I loan the money, because there was never a collection here. So they're going to ask a question. What did this person hold who said that the positive is, if we're going to read it this way, that there's a positive commandment to rip the star, and therefore you don't get lashes for loaning on interest. Well, maybe you think, and that's why are you getting lashes? You didn't do anything. You just loaned the money, but you didn't collect the interest yet. So if you say, a star that can be collected, and we've seen this before, is as if there's a machloket about this in other places, is it as if it's already collected? Now, if we view a star, like I have an IOU that you owe me for this $100 loan, $120. So if we look at it as if I already collected it, then I understand why we get lashes for this, or potentially, and then we're going to have Makloga, do I or not, because I can just rip the star. If you say that, Vav, do we surayu? But then they already did something wrong. So how could you say they can fix it by ripping the star? What does it help? You already loaned on interest, and you should get lashes just for that. It's true, you could fix it by tearing it, but you already did an Esau before you could even fix it. And if you don't view it as if it was collected, well, then you haven't done anything wrong because, yeah, I loan money on interest, but there's nothing wrong until I actually collect it. So what do they answer? We actually say it's like option two. It's not as if it was collected. Because if it was collected, then it's already too late. I can't fix it. Right? Because I already transgressed the negative commandment by just giving you a loan. If we say it's only later, then I can fix it before I collect it, and that would be okay. So now they say, it must be that it's really not collected yet, but HaKamashman, this is teaching you, Dissuma Milti. Some people have Shuma. It's a different way of explaining it. I'm going to go with Suma. Suma from the words Lotisimun Alav Neshek, which is don't put right interest on someone. Just by writing a contract and by me loaning you money and saying I'm going to collect interest, I've already transgressed a negative commandment. And that negative commandment can be fixed by tearing it because it's not too late. I haven't collected it yet. So that's what it's teaching you. And in fact, Hachinami Mistabra, the Tanan, can even prove this reading that it's true that Summa is something that it, you already transgressed just by loaning the money out. These people are transgress a negative commandment. We're now adding not just the bar, the lender, not just the borrower, not just the guarantor, but even the witnesses. Now, what do the witnesses have to do with? The witnesses obviously only have to do with the first part. They have nothing to do with the collection of it. They're there to witness that there was a loan taken. So everyone else, the malva, the lova, the guarantor, all those people were part of the, the whole action. They took money, they committed to, to give money, all that. But, but what did the Adim do? It must be that that moment of loaning the money is already a significant moment of transgressing. And again, all this proves is that when the, the second option of reading this, which then removes it completely from Rabbi Yochanan, because Rabbi Yochanan's way of reading it was, what's the kuma say? Return the money. And that was his whole proof. Oh, they say you can return the money. And Tanakama says you don't have to return the money, which is Rabbi Yochanan's opinion. But according to the second thing, it's about ripping the shtar. And ripping the shtar, what would be the point? Because isn't it, right? It's, the point is if you say it's kigavoy, then it's too late. Ah, it must be it's not kigavoy, but you've already, there is a transgression in just lending out the money. And that could be rectified by tearing it and never actually collecting it. So that's how we would have to read it, and that's the second reading, which then doesn't really help us with this difficulty of Rabbi Yochan, against Rabbi Yochanan. So we basically, what we did so far is, what's Rabbi Elazar's proof? Pasuk, we said, what does Rabbi Yochanan do with it? Rabbi Akiva's opinion against Ben Petorah about the, the canteen of water in the desert. There were two difficulties against Rabbi Yochanan. The first one we resolved very well. The second one we somewhat resolved, but not so clear that that's, there's a good resolution there. Now we're going to move on to Rav Safra. Rav Safra takes on the opinion of Rabbi Lazar and explains the following. He's now going to say, in which cases can the rabbis collect, enforce, sorry, um, that, you, that the borrower, uh, the, sorry, in which cases can the court enforce returning the interest payment to the, to the borrower? 
and in which cases not. So he says this kind of complicated language, which we're going to have to figure out and say, wait, this doesn't seem to match everything we know, but we're going to resolve it. We're going to have two questions from Rav Safra and then resolve it and then explain really what does he mean, what's his distinction here. He's going to make a distinction between, he's going to compare Jewish law and Gentile law. And he says the following, if in their courts, they can make the love, the borrower, pay this to the malve, like, for example, interest, okay, in Gentile courts, you can loan money on interest. In our law, in our law, things that they collect, we, if our malve collected them, the, bar, the lender in our court, in our um, law, you would force the Malva to return it. That fits with Rabbi Elazar, but there's certain things that we return. If there's something in the Gentile courts, they don't allow the Lova, they don't force the Lova to give to the Malva if there was some sort of agreement, which we'll get to what this means. So in our courts, we don't make the Malva return this to the Lova. Okay, we're going to have to see what on earth he means. First, we're going to have some questions. I'm really Abai, Abai is going to say, Le Rav Yosef, Uchlalahu, is this true? I'm going to give you an exception to the rule. Hare se'a b'se'a. Dibidinehem otzim milova l'malve, ubidinehenu em atzirim milova l'alov. L'alvot se'a b'se'a, which we'll talk about in a minute, what it is, is only forbidden by rabbinic law, which means nobody thinks by rabbinic law that the rabbis can force you to return it. So what does this mean? I lent you a se'a of wheat. And I want to get back a say I have wheat. Now, what's the problem? If I get my loan back in a year, well, in that year, the price could have gone up. Now, it's not Rebik Tzutzah because we didn't agree on interest from the beginning, but the rabbis forbade this because it could be a case where I'm going to now get back something that's higher in value. So if I lend you a, a pound of wheat, I can't take back a pound of wheat a year later because I'm now possibly going to get more for my money that I loaned you, and that's going to be interest. Now, in the Gentile courts, you can do this. So that would be a case where we force the lova to pay that. If the lova committed to pay se'av wheat, they would have to pay, you know, they borrowed a se'av wheat, they return a se'av wheat. But in our courts, it's only forbidden by rabbinic law. So the rabbis, if I collected that se'av wheat and it was now worth more money, I don't have to return the extra to you. So that breaks this principle of Rav Safra. So Amar Leh, when Abayah said this to Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef answered, Inu b'tora pikadon ataliyadeh. When I loan a se'ah, se'a, the reason why in the Gentile courts they have to return it is not because this is a loan that's legit to collect interest on. No, it's because they view it, okay, and this is going to be a big thing. We're always going to make distinctions. Is this a loan or is it a sale or is it a picadon? Like the way they view this is, it's really like the Gentile is watching the grains of the person who gave him the grains and therefore has to return them, but not because it's a loan with interest. It's, it's not, we don't view this as a loan with interest. Now, the rabbis forbade it anyway, but the reason why it's allowed and the Gentile courts will enforce this, and yet we don't enforce that the Malva return this, and therefore it doesn't break his claw because he was talking about loans, and this isn't exactly a loan. It's more like it looks like you're just watching someone's property and returning it. Now, even though you're taking these grains and returning other ones, it still has the semblance of returning something that, that someone just asked you to watch. And that's why the Gentile courts, they will enforce this, but we won't necessarily enforce it to be returned because that's not what Rav Safra was referring to. He was referring to loans, really loans. Another case where they can enforce, but in our courts, we won't force you to give it back. So what's the case here? This is... I loan you money, and you give me your land as collateral. Now, in the Gentile courts, the way it works is, I gave you $1,000, you gave me a collateral, and now, while I have the, the property in my possession, I can eat all the produce from it. And when, I give, when you give me back the money, I give you back your land. But anything I ate, I ate. It's mine. Okay, now, Jewish law says you can't do that. Because that's, in the end, you're getting back $1,000 for your loan, and you're getting all the produce that you ate. And below nachiata means that we didn't deduct. You know, there's one way to do it is, I eat fruits. Let's say the first year I eat $200 worth. So we deduct $200 from the loan. This is without deducting. So if I, in the end, I'm going to collect $1,000 on this, I'm not allowed to do that. But if I did, we don't enforce it. Like we don't say you have to return that money. So this is called a vak rebeat. This is a rabbinic rebeat because it's not exactly rebeat because why? I didn't say in the beginning, I'm going to collect more money. I'm lending you $1,000. I'm going to get back 
$1,200? No, I said, I'm going to lend you $1,000. I took a collateral, I ate the payroll, and then, right, and then you gave me back the $1,000, I gave you back your land, but I kept the payroll. So we don't make me return those. But in Gentile law, they would force the love. Like the love would be, in other words, the, the lender would be able to eat all those payroll. So it also doesn't seem to fit his principle. To which they say, again, they're going to say, this is different. This isn't really a loan. Obviously, there was a loan. But the way that the, borrower, the lender got the, the produce was kind of through a sale. Because when you gave me your land for collateral, it was as if I purchased the land. And that's why in the Gentile courts, you have the right, I have the rights to eat the produce. And I don't have to return to you and I don't have to deduct it from the loan. Because it was more like a sale. And again, that then removes it from laws of loans, which is what Brooks Frost Suffer's principle was talking about. So now they say, okay, well then what was he talking about? Ella, kol she'ilu b'dinehem, tekamer of Suffer, my atal ashwina. So when he said in their courts, we, you know, in, in a case where they don't, have the lova pay the mala, and what, what was he talking about? So, hachi atal ashmuina. Now we're going to go back to the beginning of his words and explain them. Koshi ilu b'dinehem motziim milova lamalve, b'dinehu machzirim milova lamalve. That's just a quote from what he said, right? In their Gentile courts, they can force the lova to pay it to the malve, and in our courts, if they, we did collect it, we'd have to return it. Umay nihu. That's ribik tsutsa. That's when I loaned you money, and I said, I'm loaning you a thousand. You're going to pay me back a thousand two hundred. If that was the deal, in the Gentile courts, they would force you, if I was a Gentile and you were a Gentile, the courts would force you to pay me the $1,200. And in our courts, you're not allowed to. And if I took it, I would have to return it. Again, this all is Rav Safra fitting in with Rabbi Elazar. Obviously, Rabbi uh, Yochanan would disagree. Kol she'ilu b'dinehem ein motzi'im, b'dinehenu ein machzirin. Now, what's the case where in their courts, they don't force it? They don't force the lover to pay the malveh? And in our courts, we therefore, if you collected it, you wouldn't have to give it back. What would that be? Ribit mukdemet, ribit mulcheret. Ribit mukdemet, ribit mulcheret is not like ribit tzutza, where I said I'm loaning you a thousand dollars, you have to give me twelve hundred dollars back. But it would be a case where you want to get a loan from me. So we'll start with ribit mukdemet. And what do you do? You give me a gift before the loan, and then you say, "Look, I'm giving you this gift so that you lend me money." Okay, here's a gift. And now I'm going to, you know, I really want you to give me a loan. Now, that can't be enforced in a Gentile court because you're doing it of your own volition. It wasn't part of the deal. It wasn't like I said, you have to give me a gift before. It was just you gave me a gift to butter me up so that I would give you the loan. Now, in Jewish law, this is forbidden by rabbinic law because it's not part of the loan. So it's not like Rebik Tzutza where we agreed to this. It was just you decided to give me a gift in order to encourage me to loan you the money. So I'm not allowed to do that because in the end, for this, right, let's say the gift was worth $200. So in the end, I'm going to get $1,200 for the loan that I gave you of $1,000. So we can't do it, but it's only rabbinic and therefore we don't enforce it. And it can't be enforced by Gentile courts because you decide to do it of your own volition. It wasn't part of the deal. Maybe Mulcheret is the exact same thing, but the opposite. I loaned you $1,000. You gave me back $1,000. And then you said, you know, Michelle, I'm so appreciative that you did this. I'm giving you a gift. So again, by Jewish law, you can't do this, but only by rabbinic law. And therefore, if you did give it to me, I don't have to return it, even according to Rabbi Elazar. Whereas, you know, obviously Rabbi Yochanan doesn't think I ever need to return it, but that would be the case that Rabbi Safra was talking about. Okay, so again, a summary of this part, and then we won't go back to this because now we're going to start something totally different, which is actually the more complicated part of today's stuff. We had a machlok at Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Ketsutza, the Torah law, Rabbi, does the court enforce returning it or not? We saw Rabbi Elazar's proof. We saw... Rabbi Yochanan's proof in yesterday's staff. Then we brought two difficulties with, we, we said, what does Rabbi Yochanan do with Rabbi Elazar's proof with the, with the canteen? We had two difficulties against Rabbi Yochanan. We somewhat, at least resolved the first for sure, the second one somewhat. Then we had the statement of Rabbi Safra, which we needed to understand. We worked it out. That was all according to Rabbi Elazar. And now we're going to move on to the case and the mission. It was very complicated. that We didn't really understand when we read it. So if you go back to Salma Hamabet, the mission reads like this. And we're going to have a... It's going to take us into tomorrow. This is quite complicated. And we're going to start learning other things about Rebid as we go through this. The Mishnah talked about a case where Lakachimenu Chitim Bidinar Zahav Hakor. So the and the Hashar, the rate was twenty-five dinar for a core of wheat. And I bought Chitim from you for that amount. 
Um, do chitim b'shloshim dinarim. Then chitim went up. So I gave you 25 dinarim for wheat. You didn't give me the wheat yet. Then what happened? The rate went up to shloshim dinarim. A core of wheat is now worth 30 dinarim. Amarlo, and I said, listen, I want my chitim now because you, you didn't give them to me yet. I want them. Now, it sounds like it's a sale, not a loan. We're going to have to see. Is it a sale? Is it a loan? Is What's going on here? I say, I want my chitim now. Give me the chitim that I bought. I want them because now they're worth 30. I want them at this rate. And I want to buy wine. I want to sell the chitim and buy wine with them. You say, okay, I'll give you your chitim. They're now worth 30. I'll give you them for 30, but you know what? I'll give you them at the 30 rate, but I'm not going to actually give them to you. I'm going to give you wine instead. I'm going to flip the, the, the grains that I owe you. I'm going to flip them onto wine. And then I'll give you wine for them. 30 dinarim's worth of wine. So I give you 25. I'm going to get back 30 in wine. But yayin ain't low. But I don't, you don't actually have wine in your possession. If you have wine in your possession, it would work. Because you don't have wine in your possession, it doesn't work. So now the Gemara is going to have a big problem with this. Okay, and we're going to have to figure, we don't really understand this yet, so don't worry. We still won't understand it by the end of today, unfortunately. So now the Gemara, I'm not going to re-quote it from the words in the Gemara here, because we've read the whole thing in the Mishnah. Now the Gemara says, What's the difference? If, and this is Rebit de Rabbanan, because I gave you 25 and I got back 30. Now, it wasn't exactly in a form of a loan, so it wasn't Rebit de Oraita, and it wasn't like we agreed from the beginning. It would be, uh, I would get it at a higher rate, but in the end, I'm getting something worth more. And it's a loan now because, you know, you said, I'm going to give you wine, but you don't actually give me the wine, right? You, you flipped it on, and now I'm going to wait to get that wine, but I'm going to get it at a higher rate. So now they say, what's the difference? He in lo yayin my habit. Why, if you don't have wine, is this a problem? The hatanya, it says in a brighta, it's actually a mishnah, sorry, it says in a mishnah later on in this chapter. It says tanya, but it should be tanan. En poskin ala perot ad shietze hashar. Yatza hashar poskin. This is a big law we're going to learn, which is, I can't give you money at the beginning of the season before the rates have come out, what this is worth. I can't give you money up front and say, I'm locking in before the prices come out. Presumably, you could get things for a cheaper rate because you don't know, like, are the crops going to grow? Are they not going to grow? So you're getting money up front, okay? We can't link into this rate, this lower rate, let's say 25 dinarim right now, when they haven't, it's the beginning of the season, and they haven't come up with a set rate yet, okay? But once there's a set rate, because what will happen, maybe they'll go up in value, and I'll have paid you 25, and I'll get them for 30. But once the shar is set, and the assumption here is in the Mishnah, since it didn't say it depends on whether the shar is set or not, once there's a set price, we're already toward the middle of the season, and they've decided, okay, we know this is the price for wheat this year because we know this is how much wheat is grown, this is how much demand there is, we've set a price. Once there's a price set, we can, I can give you money right now, and you can tell me, I'll provide you with the wheat for the next year. I'll give you a little bit every month, let's say, okay? Even if you don't have wheat, and this is the whole thing, you can basically say, I can give you money right now, you can give me wheat throughout the course of the year, and if the wheat goes up in value, I still get it linked into that, uh, locked into that lower price. So I will get, in the end, I theoretically could end up with more. Okay, I'm allowed to do this. Why is that? Because even if you don't have in your possession, and this is going to be the whole thing, the Mishra seems to say only if you have wine, because then it's as if you gave me the wine, even though you did it. But it's as if you gave me the wine and said, this wine is designated as yours, and that would be okay. But if you don't have wine, you can't. Now, they say it doesn't, shouldn't matter. Because what? The Mishnah says, because I have money right now. Because I have money, I can go, I have buying power. I can go buy that, those grains anywhere. So since I could buy them today, if you tell me I'm going to give them to you over time, since I could have bought the whole thing today with the money I had, therefore I can link it to this price and you can give it to me over the course of 12 months. And even if it goes up, it's not going to be viewed as interest. So, the question is, why doesn't our Mishnah say that? And as our Mishnah seems to say it all depends whether you have wine or not, but why? It should be just like Poskim ala Perot. So, I'm a rabbi. It's because there's something, that's a sale. That case I said, Poskim ala Perot, if there's a shar, I can be Posek ala Perot, is because I'm doing a sale. I have the money right now. And because I have the money in hand, I could theoretically go buy them anywhere, and that's why it doesn't matter if you have or not. But in this case, remember what happens. I go to you, I, I gave you money, 
Then you said, I'm going to give you wheat, but you didn't give me the wheat yet. And then I said, listen, I want the wheat so I could go sell it and buy more wheat, but I don't have money in hand to buy wheat. It's not the same as post Gimala Perot, since I could just take my money and buy it anywhere, therefore I can lock into this price. In this case, I don't have money in hand. I want to get the wheat back. And you say, oh, listen, I'll turn the wheat into wine, and I'll give you the wine, but I'm not going to give it to you today. That means I don't have any buying power. So that's not the same case. It's bala chuv In other words, you're just committing to me the value of what you owe me, but I don't have the money in hand. Uchiditanyan. It's more like this bright, which is hareshayano sheba chavero maneh. If you, if you owe me a hundred, the halach va'amad al gorno, and I go to your threshing floor and I say, Omer, tenli mautai, I want my money back right now. Shani wrote, said the kach ba'em chitim, because I want to go buy wheat. So I don't have money in hand. This is exactly more like this case, not the post kimala peyro. Amar lo chitim yeshli, shani no ten You say, oh, you want wheat? No problem. I won't give you money back. I have wheat. I'll give you wheat. That's what you want the money for anyway. I'll give you wheat. But you say, okay, I'll give you wheat, but I'm going to give it to you a little bit every month for the next 12 months. That you're not allowed to do. to Because why? Because I don't have the money in hand to say I could have bought this anywhere. I don't have the money. In that case, you're not. it's not like you have any sore in your hand. Any sore is a, a coin. It's not like I have a coin in my hand. So because of that, I this doesn't work. So that's what our mission is like, and that's why it all depends. If you have wine, then it would be as if you're giving me the wine there now, and that's okay. But turning it into a loan where you're going to give it to me over the course of time, if you don't have the wine in hand, and I don't have, right, that's going to be a problem. So I'm a Abai. Abai says, I don't get it, though. They say, wait a minute. That has nothing to do with yeshlo or enlo. If you're basically going to keep my money, and I don't have money in hand right now at all, and you're going to keep my money for longer and give me things over the course of time, that's more like a loan, and that can't even be done even if you have the wine in your in your hand. So that doesn't match the case in the Mishnah, because the case in the Mishnah all depends, yesh low or ain low. And this issue is going to be a problem even if yesh low. So, therefore, Abai rejects this reading. So the first reading, which was, I think it was Rabbi's reading, right? What did we say here? Um, Rabbi's reading, Abai rejects. Abai says it can't be that this whole problem is because it's a loan, because if it was a loan, it would be a problem no matter what. Because again, Poskimala Peirot is I'm buying. I have money right now. I can lock into a price and you can give me the money over time, the, the produce over time. That's not a problem. But only if I have the money in hand. If I don't have the money in hand, it doesn't matter whether you have the produce now or you don't have the produce now, either which way it's forbidden. And we're going to see later if there's an opinion that says there is a distinction. But right now, the main opinion is there is no distinction, yeshlo or enlo, and therefore they reject this. So now, elam rabaye, matnitin kedetane rav safer beribi to be rabbi chia. Okay. is going to now say, we're just missing a lot of details in the case. The Mishnah forgot to tell us the whole beginning. And then he's going to explain this whole extra stuff that should have been in the Mishnah. And then Rav is going to say, but these words don't match what you're saying. These words don't match what you're saying. These words don't match what you're saying. And eventually, we'll try to explain, explain, explain. And in the end, we're going to reject this. So let's see. Abai says, it's just like Rav Safra said in this Rebi to Be Rabbi Chia, when he was learning Rebi in the house of Rabbi Chia. The time of Rav Rebi Rabbi to Be Rabbi Chia, he explained this Rebi from the house of Rabbi Chia. Yesh varim shemu talim. There's things that really aren't interest. But asulim ipne hara mat Rebi. But it, it, it smells of interest. It, it looks, right? It's like you're tricking someone. So what does this mean? Kate said, Amarlo, Halveni Mane. I say, you say to me, lend me a hundred. I say, no problem, here's a hundred. Amarle, oh no, sorry. You say, lend me a hundred. I say, Mana Ainli, I don't have a hundred, but Chitim be Mana Yeshli Shani no Tenacha, but I have a hundred's worth of wheat. I'll give you that. And you can sell it if you want, okay? So I give you wheat instead of the money. So I gave you a manez worth of chitim. Then you wanted money for this, and somehow I came into money. Because originally I said I didn't have money. But I discounted you the rate. So I bought the wheat from you. Now we still have a loan out. You still owe me 100 from the wheat. But I bought the wheat that I gave you from you for a discounted price. I bought it for 24 sella, which is 96 out of 100. I Right, I gave you a hundred's worth, and then I bought it from you for 96. Mutal, technically speaking, this is okay, because what's going to happen? 
I bought the wheat for you for 96. You gave me a discount on it. Then, I'm sorry, I gave you a discount on it. I, right, I paid less than the, the going rate. Okay, so I gave it to you for cheaper. And that's, sorry, I bought it. Hazar with the Kacham, right. Sorry, I bought it. You gave it to me for a discounted price. So you gave me a benefit here. Okay, so I got a benefit. And then later, you're going to pay me the 100 that you owe me. So what happened? I got 100 back for my money, for my loan, exactly the right amount. But I got this side benefit that when you sold me the wheat, you sold it to me for a cheaper rate. So I gained something from you. So even though technically speaking, this isn't rebid, asur la still came in pnehara not rebid. But I kind of ended up with something extra here because I got the discounted rate on the on the grains. So in other words, there were two different transactions going on. One was a loan. I, I gave you a hundred in wheat. I got back a hundred in money or wheat. It doesn't really matter. But in the interim, that wheat that I gave you, you sold to me for a discounted price. So I gained a benefit. So that's called haram aribit, and that's what he says our case is. So now we're going to explain it. So what happened in our case? Hachanami kigonda amar, halvenish loshim dinarim. You said to me, loan me 30 dinarim. Now remember, our case started with 25, and then the shower went up to 30. Here we're going to say, no, no, no. It was the, originally it was 30. I loaned you 30 dinarim, just 30 di- money. Amar lei, well, you wanted to borrow 30 dinarim from me, but amar lei shloshim dinarim mainly. But then I said, I don't have 30 dinarim. I'll give you 30, though, in wheat. And then what's the 25 mentioned in the Mishnah? Ah, I bought them back for you for 25. It's the exact same case, just different amounts of money. I bought it for 25 instead of 30. So, and then what happened? Now comes in the Mishnah. Then I go to get my 30 back, and you say, oh, I don't have it in wheat, I'll give it to you in wine. But then you don't have wine. So, if you actually have wine, you can give it to me in wine. Because what's the problem? It only looks like Haramari beat if you're actually giving me money. If you give me 30 dinarim after, then it's 30 dinarim, and I got the discount of, four dinar, of five dinarim, that would be a problem. But if you give me in wine, it's okay. Because that doesn't really look like Ribi. Because you're just giving me produce back. So that's why if you have the wine, it works. If not, not. And with that, he resolves the problem that we have with Rabba, which is why would it matter? Yesh lo ain lo. Vi lo. And if not, kevan delay lecham. Rav adai mishkal zuzim mine mechse karibit. If you don't have wine, then you're going to in the end give me 30 dinarim. And when you give me the money, it's going to look like it was ribit. Because I bought for 25 and right, I got the five dinarim discount. So in the end, I benefited. So I'm really Rava. Rava starts questioning. No, the words really don't match what you're saying. Ihachi tain li chitai shouldn't be give me the wheat, it should be dmei chitam If the whole problem is the money, I should have said I want the value of the chitim, not the, the chitim themselves. Tanei dmei chitai. So they say, okay, change it to, I want, I'm looking back to get the, the value of my chitim. Sha'ani mocham, that I'm selling to you, shemechartim lecham I already sold to you, it should have said, because the whole point was there was a sale in the middle there. So tanei shemechartim lecham. So change those words. Harei asuyim alai b'shloshim dinarim. Well, now you say, and now the wheat is worth 30. But what do you mean? But originally it was worth 30. So that doesn't make sense either. So this is what, the, now they're going to reread that whole thing. Not that it is now worth 30. That originally was worth 30. I want my money back. Right? You say, sorry. You're the one who says, the 30 you gave me originally, now I'm going to give it to you in wine. So they change a bunch of words and it kind of works. But here comes the big knockout. And with this, we'll end today's stuff. Um, but it says the rate was 25. According to your story, that's how I might be to buy it. The rate was 30 and it, and you just gave me a discounted price of 20, of 25. That's not what the rate was. So that really doesn't make any sense. And you really can't change that. So Rob is going to now give his third interpretation. And with that, we'll wait for tomorrow. So we had two interpretations here about what could possibly be the case in the Mishnah based on this problem of our Mishnah doesn't seem to match this in Puskim ala Peiro, but once Yashar, Yatsashar, Puskim, and that's basically what this is. So we had to try to explain why this is not like Puskim ala Peiro, either because Puskim ala Peiro is where there's a sale. This was a loan, right? And we're, we're, we're using a loan for this kind of thing, and that's more of a problem. But that shouldn't matter then. Yesh lo ain lo. We rejected that reading. And then we tried to say maybe it's this haramat ribid. And then we have to add all these details that there was really a sale and that it, right, with, there was a loan and then a sale with a discounted price. 
And we said, but that's really not what it's talking about because it says the rate is 25, not the discounted rate. So we're stuck and we don't have an explanation yet. We're going to have to wait till tomorrow to explain the mission. And this was a bit complicated, a bit of a long duff. But uh, as you see, hopefully as we get through this chapter and we go through these concepts over and over again, it will get easier to grasp the different complicated concepts of when something is repeat and when it's not repeat. That will finish for today. Wishing everyone a great day.